Good afternoon, everyone. So how do we feed the world in 2050? This is something we've been thinking a lot about at Energaia. We think the solution is to grow a microalgae called spirulina, which is high in protein, vitamins, antioxidants, and minerals. You probably had a taste of it in the smoothie that you, you had today. <clears throat> we actually grow this in urban environments in Bangkok and Singapore. And we also grow in rural environments in India and Bangladesh. It's traditionally been grown in open ponds or taken out of natural lakes. Um, but this, is, this can be prone to contamination, airborne contamination specifically. Our innovation is that we developed a closed tank system that's low cost, easy to scale and replicate, um, and prevents this contamination because, because of the closed nature of the system. We have three patents in process, and we've licensed this system already in France and Singapore. We have a five-year commercial track record operating our technology at, through the development phase, so we've learned a lot of lessons and made a lot of improvements. Um, and because of this track record, we've actually gotten a lot of exposure. We've won numerous awards from the Australian government, uh, we were one of the Blue Economy Challenge winners last year. Uh, we won uh, a prize from USAID uh, uh, operated by Winrock, the Tech for Farmers Challenge. And we've also uh, come in uh, second place at a couple of recent social enterprise competitions. We've also re received a, a lot of global press coverage, including a very recent uh, TV piece on uh, Food Unwrapped in UK's Channel 4, which is pretty interesting if you, if you like that show. Now, what do we do with the spirulina we produce? We do not make tablets or supplements. We make functional food products. Um, the smoothie I mentioned, we make pastas. We have several samples at the table. We're at energy balls and, and other uh, mainstream foods that you can consume without having to take tablets and still get a tremendous amount of nutritional value. And we also uplift livelihoods in the process. To meet the growing demand that we have already, we work with rural communities where we have a contract plus subsistence farming model. Um, farmers grow the spirulina using our technology and with our technical support. We buy 80% of their production. They keep 20% for household consumption to improve their own nutritional health. And this enables a tripling of their daily income, which is additive, because our system only requires three hours per day, three days per week to operate. So it doesn't displace the existing household income streams. We have a diverse team of 18 people in three countries around the world with uh, a variety of backgrounds who are helping us implement uh, our mission. Spirulina is a three and a half billion year old microorganism. We call it the first food. Um, it was consumed by ancient civilizations, but our vision of the future is for it to be a 20 million ton per year commodity by 2050 to help feed the world. We view it as a fish of the future. So our vision is to see spirulina grown everywhere, on rooftops and in rural communities around the world. And what we're looking for is help to connect with large commodity buyers in the US and EU, as well as socially minded investors. We're well capitalized through 2018, but we are looking at a next raise next year. Thank you very much. Um, could you talk a little bit about the unit economics for rooftop deployment? Um, I think we're involved in solar and some other things as well, and it would seem to me that's a very competitive space. I mean, that's certainly what we see up there. So what's the, the sort of per square foot unit economics for spirulina versus other alternatives that you could do with your roof, if I'm a commercial building owner? Yeah, it, great question. So I, I haven't looked at it in that context, but I can give you some of the background figures. We pay uh, a rent, we, we pay for all the capex, we pay for utilities on separate meters, and we buy insurance to protect damage uh, from the rooftop owner. So it's a low risk uh, value stream addition for them on space that, we, I mean, we target ones that aren't targeted for solar implementations anyway, because we need a, um, a certain minimum loading requirement to hold the water in the tanks. Um, and, and by doing that, the, the hotels that we work with, for example, get a CSR benefit without any outflow of cash, and they get a lot of media presence uh, benefit as well. So the economics are good for them. For us, we keep all the harvest and we sell it. Um, it's just another space for us at a pretty good rent rate um, in the middle of the city where we have most of our customers, so our logistics costs go down. I, I can give you specific numbers separately if you like, but in general, the economics are very favorable for these, this model. 
How many units do you have in the field right now? Um, we have, between all of the different countries, about uh, 1,600. We're installing another 1,200 that we just shipped to Phuket. We sent a container of 600 to Bangladesh. Uh, so those are, I'm not counting in the number that I gave you. I'm only counting operating units. Um, by the end of this year, we should have uh, more than 3,000 operating. And by next year, we should have somewhere around 10,000 or more. So what revenue will that be next year? Because uh, that, um, you're scaling up, <coughs> according to your financial projections, quite rapidly in the next few years. In the last seven years, it was negligible. So It's true. Um, uh, we're getting, we actually have a couple of different revenue streams now because we started selling our system commercially um, to customers uh, overseas, and we get a licensing agreement as well as profit from the system sales. And then we also are our own producer, and we're starting to take uh, large offtake agreements from customers. So we have about 20 tons of demand coming through in Bangladesh, uh, so that's driving a lot of the production there. Um, we probably won't be able to fulfill all of that in 2018 as we scale up production, but we also have uh, a distributor that we send to in Vietnam, and we have demand coming from uh, uh, existing customers in Thailand, um, but we, because we're in the process of getting organic certification, and that's the only holdup for another offtake agreement that'll be about five tons a year, scaling up to as much as uh, about 20 tons per year. So what will that translate to in terms of revenue for coming year? So actually, th that those were the assumptions that fed into the five-year financial projection that I think you're referring to. So those numbers are, so we did a very detailed price elasticity analysis to see what the bulk commodity price of spiraling is. And then we said, we use those, and we, I think you would see in the model that we showed a, a degradation of price over the next five years to kind of this bulk level. Um, and, and that drives the economics that are there with scale-up. I mean, some of the challenge for us is the rapidity of the scale-up, and that's why we are looking for an investor that would be a strategic partner for us uh, coming on board next year to help us as we manage a lot of the country opportunities that we have in the pipeline for expansion. So you referred to a bulk commodity price for spirulina. My understanding, and I'm not an expert on this, is there's like a 3x variation in spirulina prices depending on perceived quality and point of origin. So how do you think about your pricing and how it can, yeah? It's a great question. So what we've seen in the market today is that price can range on a dry weight basis um, at large bulk anywhere from $7 per kg up to 30 something dollars per kg. Now what we've done is we think that stable price point is about $20 per kg plus or minus a little bit. That's the number we're using in our models, and that's where we're in lower economic countries like Bangladesh, we've been successful in taking orders. In Thailand, we can get a bit of a higher price, and also some customers we're speaking to in uh, Europe and the US, we can get uh, a higher price. But um, to determine the quality parameters, what we're actually trying to do is talk to US large bulk ingredient buyers and understand We've been looking at other commodities that they buy that are in a similar form as spirulina powder, so cinnamon, black pepper, et cetera. And we want to create a specification sheet and a methodology that is the exact same. Because the other producers who are all kind of artisanal scale, right, they, they say the same things as us. You look at very basic parameters like color, smell, heavy metals, contamination, et cetera. If we can formulate that in a spec, it'll be an easy way to go to bulk buyers in a consistent manner to show why we should get the price we get. Uh, what percentage of your, of your margins do the farmers get to capture? And as you guys scale and grow and margins will inevitably get compressed, how do you maintain the integrity of that margin for farmers? It's a great question. So we try to give them uh, at least 50% because, I mean, I haven't done the margin calculation exactly, but I'll show you the real numbers. We assume, as I mentioned, a $20 bulk price. We buy from them at $10, but unprocessed. So we have the cost for processing, logistics, and distribution. Now, we have customers already, and a lot of them are in the domestic market. So for example, that's the numbers I cited are for Bangladesh, where we already have orders, right? So the economics work, and we translate a lot of that value down to the, to the farmer, because we still make enough, and we also sold them the system at a, a very nominal uh, profit. So between this model, in aggregation, we actually do uh, fine margin-wise ourselves as well. Thank you. Thank you.